Our next speaker is our respected colleague, uh, Franco Weibel. So, Franco, why don't you come on up? Franco has led the horticulture program at the Research Institute of Organic Agriculture, FIBEL, in Frick, Switzerland, since 1994. His research ranges from soil management to crop and plant physiology to fruit quality and marketing issues in uh, fruit in Europe. Since 1996, he has worked to form the Organic uh, Fruit Working Group within the ASA, ISHS and is very active in international collaborations on organic. Uh, Franco will present an overview of the situation of organic fruit production and marketing in Europe. Good morning, everybody. So uh, it's really a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. And thanks again to David and, and his crew for bringing us together here. It's really an honor. So, and my job will be, when the slides come, <laughs> to, to give you an impression or to give you a, a, a broader picture about the organic fruit development in, in, the, in Europe. And I, I will try to give you a bit the. Okay, okay. I will try to give you an uh, an overview on the, the 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 bigger picture, but also some details that are that are now stimulating the stimulating the development. So just a glance where I'm from, our institute. So we are people is a private foundation. We are clearly focused on organic, not exclusively. But we were founded in 1973. By now we are 135 staff members. Our self-funding is 80%, which is tough, I tell you. <laughs> then we are we have branches in Germany, Austria, Hungary, <coughs> Hung Hungary, Luxembourg, and Czech Republic. So <coughs> This will be the content of my talk. I'll let, I'll let you read quickly through it yourself. Okay, we start with the first chapter. This is uh, the current challenges and emerging issues of the European fruit sector in general. And this, the, the points that will come up now is not a Franco Weibel <laughs> invention. It's a, it, it largely is according to the EU Commission for Agriculture and Rural Development. So, point one. So, the growers of fruit and vegetables are poorly organized. Only 43% are organized in co ops, and the EU, EU policy was clear it was about 60%. This poor organization status limits the bargaining power and professionalism with distribution chains or processing, processing companies. But it also, this weak position affects prices, of course, but also allows buyers to constantly ask for more to the producers. So they ask for label productions, for special qualities, also for special services like uh, special packages, uh, more complicated logistics or even deferred payments. Second point, there is an increased globalization of the market. This induces more competition from products outside the EU and this of course increases the uncertainty about product prices, about the access to the formerly usual markets. Also, it increases the uncertainties for input prices and their availability. An example is uh, energy, fertilizers, or other input material. It uh, also increases the, the, there are more chances like this with the globalization of market disruptions like uh, fiscal crisis, boycotts, trade barriers. Third point, <coughs> we can clearly see a widening of the gap between between output and input prices for the growers. So this, of course, squeezes the margins of the growers. That's clear. But it also induces a push for higher yields and lower costs to, to compensate for this squeeze of margins. And this, all this with by tendency, or sometimes unfortunately clearly, a negative effect on natural resources and environment. Fourth point, what? 
climate changes. <clears throat> so, of course, this offers more production possibilities in colder regions now for fruit. On the other hand, less for, for the warmer regions in the Mediterranean area. But this is accompanied by more extreme events, so drought, storms, and as flowering period is going earlier all the time, we have uh, more risk for bad pollinization weather and increased frost risks. It exactly happened like this this year in, in larger parts of Europe. Overall, this globalization, uh, the climate change, sorry, <laughs> increased the volatility of fruit production uh, as uh, is expected. Then, second, uh, and the next point is a stagnation or a falling consumption of fruit. Indeed, it is uh, quite. It was quite frightening to read that uh, there was a decrease of nine per nine point four percent of the fruit consumption compared to the 2000, 2000, 2005 to 2010 period. That went down to 219 grams per fruit, fruit of fruit per person a day. So uh, a little positive uh, news here is that in Switzerland we have an increase of 5% to 212 grams. But of course, there is this ongoing financial crisis, and this puts really a high pressure on the food prices. And we can see that clearly that in, in the fact that discounter markets with very low prices are expanding. So with, with this, I can come to now the, the specific circumstances for organic fruit in the, in the let's say, socioeconomic environment where growers have to take their short or let's say mid-term to long-term decisions. The good news is most retailers and supermarket chains now offer organic fruit, as we heard before. But there is an increasing, because of this high price pressure, there is an increasing gap between organic and conventional shop prices. And this, of course, then the retailer says, oh no, this difference, this huge difference is not accepted by the buyers anymore. You must go down with your organic prices as well independently what the production prices are, of course. <clears throat> so in the 2009 and 10 severe recession, surprisingly, the organic market in, in Europe still grew by, uh, in a, as an average, 9.5%, except in the UK where there was a decline by about 10%. And surprisingly, the, the European market absorbed 4,000 hectares, which is a plus of third, almost 30% new organic apples in the, in the last two years. So this is really a surprise. Okay, Golden Delicious was, was, uh, was um, affected badly, but uh, it, was, it was quite a good sign. Now there are 14,000 hectares of apple, organic apple and pear in Western Europe. Let's say there are more, but these are the dominate market dominating um, sur surfaces. Although there are signs of market saturation in years of good <coughs> of good yield, this is also a clear effect. And as a consequence, there is a really a clear need that <coughs> to expand their organic consumer base a little bit similar as we have heard before. And most addresses, you said they are on the fence, <laughs> so they speak of these. Uh, uh, consumers of uh, lifestyle, of health and sustainability, the LOHA group. Okay, ne uh, next point is that uh, there was a, there is this recent US, Europe uh, organic equivalence, equivalency ag agreement. Also from that, we, both sides, I think, they expect uh, a, a positive input into the markets. We have to see what happen, what will happen. Good news is also that in, in, the, in these big EU research programs, they now regularly address also topics of organic agriculture, sometimes even fruit. And this is also a sign or an effect or a result of the, of the much more improved uh, lobbying of the organic, uh, of the organic lobby <laughs> in, uh, in Brussels. So let's uh, like, like the IFARM, IFARM, International Federation of Organic Movement. 
On the other hand, there are trends now, let's say like the, that there is an increasing demand for, from retailers, from consumers, for quantitative information on the ecological impact of production systems. So they say, oh, we say it's organic, but now prove it. How, how, what is your uh, climate, climate gas emission and so on? Is it really better than uh, conventional? So they put the CO2 print, uh, footprint on the package, or they, and then another challenge now is that the no residue labeled fruit start really competing against organic. And this is, at, this is a added value at the end product, you know, so the, the consumer knows, okay, no, no, no residues, no chemicals in there. Why should I buy more just because it is organic? And the last point in this, uh, chapter is the consumers also ask for more traceability and they get it in this extreme case they, they they can trace your number on the on the package of the fruit and they they can look at your orchard on their mobile phone okay this is nice but it's again this is an extra service which has to be provided and nobody actually nobody pays it just the extras that you have to deliver to stay in the business okay now the next chapter is the organic production and markets, the statistics. And most of the data I got is uh, the, the book of Helga Willner and, and uh, co-authors. Helga is from, from Feeble as well. And this book is download. everything in this book is downloadable, also the graphs, and so you can ex uh, extract everything there. So the current statistical assessment have uncertainties, for sure, some third world countries and so on, but they improve year by year. And But we have to be aware, even if production acreages are accurate data on yields and commercialized quantities that really determine the market, they are uh, they're really scarce or uncertain. Okay, so this is the growth of acreage acreage organic acreage in the different on the different continents and just shortly this line on the bottom is the us so you see a plateauing more or less in acreage not, not in market but, but in acreage and you see this uh, the, the upper blue line is europe and which is really healthy uh, propagating on the top and other other continents are also rather stagnating focusing on the single countries in on the mar organic market in Europe, we can see the dominating nation is uh, clearly Germany with a six billion uh, market for for Germany, organic market, but more or less a bit, yeah, a bit growth, but a bit plateauing. Also a bit plateauing is uh, Denmark, Switzerland, moderate growth, Italy. Surprisingly, the t 10 times bigger Italy is, is, is not much bigger than the Swiss market. So the Swiss are really addicted to, to organic, fortunately. <laughs> then you see this, uh, this decline in the UK here. I think it's not too drastic. And what is inter interesting is this booming line here, and this is France. And France is a fruit country. So this is really, and they, they're, if you if you are in France, there is really a very optimistic uh, an optimistic atmosphere uh, to go to to make something good now because you see how low they were. Okay, now let's have a look at the statistics: which fruit species are grown in which country? Now, <clears throat> so this is really very new data. We compose these data uh, just for this meeting, and uh, I'm proud we have them finally. So it is divided now in olives, grapes, temperate fruit, citrus fruit, and berries. Because the big players that is in all statistics, you see, oh, it is Italy and Spain. But now we see why. It, it's because the proportion of olives is really dominating. Also Greece has, has olives, OK? And then we see the grapes. Grapes is uh, Italy, Spain, and France. They are the, the about uh, on an equal level, uh, on an equal level there. And you see that this, these these crops are really dominating over, over then here the temperate fruit, uh, a little, little bit of berries. And now let's make a, 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 another focus just on the temperate fruit, which is this graph. Then we see, oh, now uh, really Italy plays the game. Spain went down here. And we see that uh, in, in Italy, we have a good proportion of apples. That's the red bars. And 
also in this in fruit tempered with no details, I think there is a good proportion of apples. We see uh, they are quite strong in pears, in cherries. I've never seen these acreages of cherries, but <laughs> statistically they are there. Then we have seen the a good proportion of peaches. This, uh, this to this figure, I trust completely, and also some plums. Then we see. I skipped Poland for for a second. Turkey is also a booming country. Turkey has huge, huge countryside of fruit, so there is a huge potential in Turkey. Actually, not a member of the EU, but uh, geographically, I think we should count. We should look at Turkey. France, a good proportion of uh, apple as well, but then also mixed, a uh, good mixed uh, offer. And you see this uh, these fruit countries, Austria also, this is most of this is apple, have more or less a bit the same dimension. And now what happened in Poland? Poland gave, uh, they got subsidies also from the EU Union uh, for, for planting apples and what they did looks like this. Just <laughs> They covered landscapes with apple, they call it maybe orchards, but it's just put the tree in, into the soil. And uh, I think this tree will probably never be harvested, but the subsidies are paid. <laughs> so this is, uh, ex these are excesses of, uh, of, of development. That's not a good example. But otherwise, Poland has a, has a really good potential, has really good uh, scientific support by Skernewice people. Ah, Greg. <laughs> and... <coughs> So, and oh, the colors are a bit strange. So now I have here data of AMI. AMI is a, is a private institute for uh, market, market uh, uh, figures, the data. And they delivered it to Bioforum. Bioforum is a, is a grower initiative to, to coordinate better this, the European, or let's say the, the German speaking, or the Northern speaking, the Northern, uh, organic fruit growers in, in Europe. So they, they, they order these data and I have the honor to present them here. So <coughs> here you have really the quantities of apples that have been on the market, not the acreage, the quantities. And if we compare the two, the, 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 the season of last, this year and last year, we see that the dominating cultivar is Royal Gala. Then we have Elstar from north, mid and northern Germany with a good proportion of uh, 16%. Then we have the first, but unfortunately also last, almost last, uh, scab resistant cultivar, Topaz, with 11%. Then it's a uh, Breburn Golden Delicious. And as we heard yesterday, these five dominating cultivars uh, are doing 75% of the market. The picture looks a little bit different, just very quickly. In Switzerland, of course, we have also Gala, we have Breburn, we have Golden, but Topaz, the scab resistant cultivar, is dominating with 18%. And together with all the other scab resistant cultivars marked here as outstanding slices, we reach now 40.4% in the organic production of, uh, with uh, scab resistant cultivars. And we are a s small fish, but here we are world champion. <laughs> okay, so about the market share, the data aren't secure, but for, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went through figures endlessly, but uh, let's say if, if we put everything together, we, can, we might say for Germany, including, including uh, importation of uh, quite precise, precisely 50% of organic apples, and for Switzerland, we estimate a market share of, in volume, 6 to 7%. Uh, but money-wise, this is about 10 to 11%. And I think this is very important to be above these 10% because then, I don't know what we would say, but then you are a bit out of the niche. And I think this is important. In Switzerland, we have a organic committed supermarket co-op where, where their share of organic apples in the total and the total of apples is now by 15, 17 percent. And this is definitely out of the niche, which is very good. It gives you just a stronger position in the in the retail in the business. 
However, berries, cherries, apricots, plums, and table grapes are all under 1 to 2%. And here is really the big growth potential. A problem we have here with the stone fruit and berry fruit is that already the, we have already high prices in, in conventional. And then it's, it's very, very hard to add up your, your organic margin that you need, let's say 30% farm gate price or so, because the absolute difference becomes so high that the consumer says, oh no, for this money difference, I could buy, uh, 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 I could buy milk or bread or something like that. So people are not thinking linearly, but absolutely. Okay, about these money issues. Okay, for we spoke about prices for organic, <coughs> for organic apple. The net farm gate, uh, the, the net farm gate prices are approximately one in in our in Europe, 1.8 plus minus times higher than conventional. This seems a lot, of course. Wow, almost double. But <coughs> you also have to consider the production costs. In Switzerland, we made uh, polls and uh, investigated this. By average, <coughs> also the production costs for organic are a uh, factor 1.7 higher. And this is due to, in this case, average 38% lower yields and 45% more labor costs per kilogram of fruit. And as a result, the income of the organic fruit grower in this average model, huh, is a uh, is modest eight percent higher, which is not really uh, tremendous much to to take all over all these risks. But <laughs> these average, after my opinion, these average calculations are useless in a way, because there are so many highly variable factors in an orchard system that you that you that you have to look at each orchard system, no, not e not even grow, but e orchard situation. What I show you here is, diff is also AMI data. I'm very proud we have it. And it shows you the prices for Gala over the years 9, 10, and 11, selling seasons. And what you can see, the, the, the prices vary between 1 euro 12 something and uh, seldomly, very seldomly less than 1 euro. So they vary in between about 10%, quite stable. And you see here the prices for gold and delicious, or even less variation, but but on a 20% lower level. And this 20% lower level of prices can be existential, for sure. So that you can see that no, you can't see, but I will, I will explain. So this is a is a nice a nice model that you that farmers can download for free from our colleagues at the Res research, Federal Research Institute in Wedensville. So here, the, a farmer can give all his standard figures for his orchard situation in, all the economic standards, and he can play with the variant. So he can compare the two, the two variants. And, and what I did here for IFP orchard was just putting the price 110 and here 0.93. And with the, with the price 110, uh, he has a chance to, to, get, to make the break even after 13 years. Okay, has, he has to wait a while. But it, with the price of uh, nine, uh, 93 cents, no chance ever to get there. I, I made the same uh, for an for organic orchard, but here I did not change prices. I kept the prices uh, stable, like that. this is a reality, and the prices are high, as I told you before, but I changed the yield. So average yield in the in the in the assessments we did was only 20.5 20, 20 tons per hectare in the year. This has also to do with alternate bearing, et cetera, et cetera. So really low. Huh? And if you succeed in, in, in increasing this moder moderate yield only 25% to, to 27 tons per hectare, which is, I think, realistic, you have really the chance to, chance to make the break even after nine years of it. But I think these tools are really very interesting because the growers can really play themselves with the, with the, decide, with the decisive factor. Okay, now we come to the last chapter. This is recent research results and activities. Yeah, I think you can see this, <laughs> this is far before. Recent research results and activities that are important for the organic fruit development in Europe. 
of course, this is my personal view, and uh, there are many other points to mention, but I have to be compact. So I start with the cultivars, but I think because I'm convinced cultivar is a really, really big issue. So for stone fruit and berries, there is still little differences to the conventional cultivar assortment. But fortunately, experiences and also the use of more organic suited cultivars starts increasing. For apple, after my opinion, the proportion of scab resistant cultivars should be really increased. Uh, and to, to increase first yield security, ecological performance, and last but not least, also credibility for organic, of organic fruit growing. Because remember, in, in Europe, we are in a humid climate, so scab control requires a lot of sprays. Especially this year, it is again is a really, a, it's a really mess. But also, fire blight tolerance is requested more and more. In Switzerland, we have a an ongoing good success with the flavor group concept to introduce new resistant cultivars into the market. I try. <laughs> so very quickly, so the flavor group concept we have we have uh, developed years ago is very simple. It's just that colored flavor labels are guiding through these all these confusing new cultivar names. So the consumer, in spite it's a it's a new name, he finds an apple corresponding to his taste. Very successful. It's even introduced now in conventional in the conventional sector in Switzerland. So what I'm speaking of, I'm not speaking of freedom and liberty and, and all these, uh, let's say, older generation. There is a new generation of very interesting resistant, scab resistant cultivars, like, uh, like Galiva from uh, Wedenswil, which I consider as an alternative to Gala. We have a Galant, which is a competitor, also an alternative to Gala. We are now testing them on larger scale on organic fruit um, orchards. Uh, Ariane, French cultivar, in very interesting alternative to Brayburn, and it's prolonging Topaz, which has a little bit of poor storability. That's that's a default of the of Topaz. And we have a uh, this selection also from Redensville with a really long, you, you can store it until August with an excellent tart uh, taste. Then we have Ladina. This, this is also has an interesting peachy taste, but it has an ex extremely good fire blight tolerance. Uh, last but not least, we have this Natira, a Dutch cultivar, which is an alternative to this uh, modern type cultivar, very very looked after now, so the type Kanzi, Cameo, Pink Lady, Honey Crisp, maybe Sweet Tango. Of course, we can debate on that, <laughs> but just, just to give you a direction. So, next point is rootstocks. After my opinion, the rootstock influence is more expressed on the organic management, but this is really underestimated. And what we need is not more, we cannot compensate just with more, with old, more with the older, more rigorous rootstocks, but what we need is more wheat competition and resistant wheat stocks. So what, after our testing, so the Geneva 11 and support 2 from, from Eastern, uh, from former East Germany, uh, seems promising. So we rather aim for trees like this, same age, same cult management like than this, huh? Th than the N9 types. So for wheat control, there are some new machines, but not, real innovation. We have some more widespread of the Swiss sandwich system. I'm always happy in the US because they like the system more than <laughs> in our country. And uh, so, but it is really offering nice opportunities. You have, it, it's really soft to the soil. It, it, it provides more, some more biodiversity, etc. So fertilization, there is an increased offer of commercial certified organic products there are a lot long lists of that and this includes also microbial bio products called biofertilizers officially uh, this contains for example this bactophil product a hungarian product which enhances bacterial activity and mineralization or mycorrhization etc and and especially this bactophil we have looked at it it, it actually it, it, it even works there is a ketinase stimulating end fertilizer, Agrobiosol, uh, which also then 
as a side effect reduces the spore, the, the scabs, overwintering scab spores, because the chitina is, can break them down. Very recently, we, we, are, uh, we, we, we could test byproducts of bioethanol production. And these have a very, uh, considerably quicker and higher nitrogen release, but it's in a testing phase. Otherwise, I see here no real innovation. Pest control. There is a, of course, like, like here, there is a huge fear for the spot wing Drosophila, Drosophila suzuki. Severe damages in Italy, and the fly is moving north towards us. There is a monitoring and research on top level combined with the, U, the U.S. Uh, colleagues and so on. Couldn't be, you couldn't do more, I would say. What, what the government did for this uh, year was that they shortened the waiting, waiting periods for Spinosad and Pyrotrine to three to six days before harvest. So this is kind of a panic reaction, I mean, but uh, what can you do? <coughs> the <coughs> sorry, the growers, they work now with nets and vinegar traps. <laughs> so another news that might interest you is the development of the granulosis virus Maddox twin which is active against codling moth and apple and pitch with, with efficacy. Some reports, and we have satisfying results, er, some, rep some reports we have on satisfying results with attract and kill methods with a spinosad, spin fly against cherry fly. That's also an, a, a progress, an important. Then uh, I w I, in Germany, they they develop the spray application of a parasitic wasp, Plichogramma evanescens, against codling moth. I think this is a very nice idea. So with this low pressure spraying and so on, and never before uh, codling moth uh, um, um, antagonists were used. So last point in this section is uh, disease control. There is an increasing use of disease. Oh. There is an increasing use of decision support tools by the organic fruit growers, which is very what, what is very positive. For example, the RIMPRO model to predict scab infec infection risks. Similar things are for codling moth and sooty blotch. What the grower can see on his uh, in his computer then, if he, uh, if he opens the page, is he sees here the rain and leaf wetness, the, the modeled amount of unripe spores of of uh, of ripe ascospores, the, the ascospores emitted, and then finally the infection risk if the leaf would be net wet. So he can just check what is the weather. If it's wet, he knows the infection risk and he knows whether he must spray or whether he can skip that date. So this is really huge progress. I think this is the right way to go. It's more specific. It's a, it's, it, it saves cost, it's, it's good for the environment, and it, it's, it's, it does better for yield security. And we have also the organic registration of carbonates, for example, uh, as, as army carb. It was registered before in the US for mm -hmm. scab and sooty, sooty blotch control. It has really a good efficacy when it is applied 16 to 24 hours after infection. And it's, it's allowing a, a much better and eco-friendlier curative scab control than with lime salt, which is, by the way, forbidden in Switzerland. So we are we are really happy with this product. So disease control for fire blight, we recommend a combined strategy using fungal antagonist Aureobasidium pullulans with a blossom protect, as acidified clay powder, the mycosin and a resistance-induced laminarin waxy plant, which will be registered for organic in next year. This is very, a, a very, very nice product because laminarin, we have good show that it also improves the sulfur efficacy against scab. So this is a nice organic concept that you have a spore killing agent, but you add, you give also something to the plant so that it can defend, defend itself with its own system in a better way. For storage diseases, there are gloria, like Gloriosporum, we have uh, with mycosin a good product with, which does a good job. Uh, much better than copper or any other substance, by the way. And we have copper is always an issue. Uh, the, the copper, copper is really the bad thing in the organic, and there are large numbers of copper copper replacement projects now ongoing in in, in Europe. For example, the Cofree project. 
thinning, okay, there is the renaissance of the rope thin thinner device, so skip over, but what we could, we made three years of trials and uh, finally got through the registration of army carp also for thinning. We could show over these years good efficacy with, with most cultivars with the application of two times 15 kilograms of army carp uh, during bloom. And uh, you can see here, this is the 15 kilogram. You have really a, a, a very good thinning effect compared to the control. So last point here is system design for more self-regulation. Substitutional intensive organic food production is an increasing concern for, for consumers, for retailers, also growers, of course. In Germany, there is an initiative called Poseidon Group. And in Europe, there is a consortium of 14 different scientific organ organic institutions uh, developing projects. FIBL is also developing an organic suited holistic method to assess socio-ecological performance of agricultural production systems after FAO guidelines. And at FIBL, that's also good news. Uh, we have a one hectare large experimental orchard where we maximize the self-regulation potential. So since six years, it is managed pesticide free. So this is this orchard, and he, we, here we really put together everything. We scab resist, resistant cultivars in mixed rows. We have the sandwich system. We have a biodiverse alleyways, biodiversity at the hedges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Fourteen different measures. So I come to the last slide with the take-home messages. So there is still a growing consumer response, but the market and competition get, conditions get harder, definitely. The success, having success, requires a higher professionalism and better grower organization. Bioforum, I think, is a very good example. Through research and growers' initiative, not to forget, valuable technical, technical progresses could be made. But if we look at it a little bit from the distance, we are still far away from yield security and production cost of IFP. We have to admit that as well, I think. And finally, new orchard system must be developed to increase all three things. So yield security, ecological performance, and long-term credibility. And last but not least, I want to address marketing. I would say more create creativity and courage to develop a different and then a truly organic way would be really worth to, to, uh, to follow. So thank you very much for your attention.